Um, um, so hopefully everyone remembered that there's um, that there's homework due today. Um, it's set on the assignment, turn it in class, but hopefully the whole thing on campus thing. Hopefully you turned it in Canvas, that's why I intended. Um, yeah, so um, that's great. So um, the uh, it's, it's, um, so for the last few lectures in class, we've been doing some uh, um, some things with vectors and matrices, and these are often more easily done in in MATLAB. And the next homework assignment, which I'll try and post either tonight or tomorrow, will be probably easiest. Uh, uh, will probably most easily be done uh, using MATLAB. You could probably do it in R or something else without too much trouble. But it be should be very easy to do with MATLAB. And many of you have said that you haven't had much experience with MATLAB. So I've um, so in the Monday, the TA hours on Monday, the um, <coughs> the TAs will kind of plan to kind of do a uh, um, so some kind of like a t tutorial thing where they'll kind of go through some examples in MATLAB. Um, so it, if you can make it to that, that would be great. There'll be lots of questions and stuff. If that's not, that doesn't work out well, we might be able to schedule another one. Yeah? Do we get any student discounts on that or anything? Do you know? Um, so, if, so you're not first person to ask. So if you go to the MathWorks website, which is a company that makes MATLAB, there is a student version for 50 bucks, um, which is not too bad. Um, there's also a free software uh, on, on, the, on, on this called Octave, um, which works for the most part. I think for this assignment, you should not see any difference between Octave and MATLAB. And then it's also available in the Cade Lab, which you should be able to go use a the computer there or to SSH into it and use it. We won't be needing any of the plotting. Well, you probably could use some of the plotting functionality, but. Um, so you should, should be able to do most of it just by SSH and um, that's easy. Um, um, so, so plan to do it on, on Monday if there's there's too many people, too many questions that then we may schedule uh, um, another time in addition to that. But let's start with that one on, on Monday. That should give you plenty of time before the next one is due. Yeah. What? Is there any special location for just normal place? Uh, so the, in the standard Monday TA hour, it's usually okay. Um, Raga. So Monday, um, from three to four. Um, and, and so if there's too much. If there are too many people there who are interested in it, then we'll. If there's too much demand, then we'll uh, um, try and schedule something else, maybe in the kid lab or something. Like that. Um, but so. Th so I've given some similar assignment the last couple of years in MATLAB, even with people without too much experience, and it's really not it's, it's really not that hard, even if you haven't used MATLAB before. Um, you can kind of it's one of those languages that you can do everything on the command line. You can kind of see what happens immediately, so you can you'll be able to see if something's going wrong with your algorithm, and it's pretty basic stuff. I'm just making you run through and see how these things work, so you kind of make sure that you understand kind of the, how to interpret this data and so forth. So, um, uh, so all right, so, um, uh, um, so today we're going to be talking about, uh, 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 we're going to be talking uh, about dealing with noise. And so noise is, really kind of the most interesting part of, of data mining. If there wasn't any noise in your data, then basically everything, we, everything we've been trying to do would be really easy. Right? If you're trying to do clustering and there's no noise, then try and find k clusters. There will be only k distinct different points in the data set. Everything else would be one of those. Things that are different from the centers of your clusters are you know, things that are noise in some sense. Right? Um, if you, if you're, try, if you're trying to regression, and you're trying to uh, linear regression, and the data lies perfectly on a line, then you just need to pick any two data points and draw the line between them, and, um, and that's your model. 
So what makes data mining interesting and challenging is dealing with all the noise. So there, there are other areas of computer science. So if, if you think of something like, um, like just data structures, Um, so this has, um, so like this topic like assumes there's no noise, right? You have your data, you want to be able to store your data and recover the data quickly. It assumes you want exactly all of the data, okay? So, so then there's other areas like um, scientific computing, right? And, and so this is dealing with more kind of numerical issues. And so this part of computing you know, realizes there is noise, although they usually think the noise is caused by, um, is, is, is like caused by the algorithms, right? And so it's caused by rounding errors in what you're doing, and you want to try and model it. So they assume <coughs> that your data coming in probably does not have much noise to it, and you want to kind of do some computation without introducing noise. And so in the process, you usually want something like less than 0.1% um, noise in your data. You want a very small amount of noise, all right? Um, so, 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 but in, um, but, um, but in areas like data mining, and so this is probably true in like machine learning as, as well, in this class of, of area that we're, we're studying, you probably have something more like, something like 10% of the data is noise. Okay, so a large amount of the data is noise. So this number, you know, 0.01%, 10%, you know, this doesn't, these, these it's, it's hard to say what this actually means. It's kind of uh, a more figurative. But the idea is there's going to be a, there's usually a lot of noise in the sort of data we've been we've been talking about in this class, and that's what brings up all these challenges and how to deal with this noise, right? So, um, so so I, I'd like to think there's there's going to be a, a large amount of noise in in what we're doing, um, and so I, I'll try and kind of I like to broadly classify the noise in into three categories, and we'll kind of talk about various, various instances of these. Um, so, so, so the first type of noise is from these um, spurious readings. Okay, so, so if you're measuring something and you get, and the, the measurement has some sort of malfunction, and you get some um, it's really strange value. So this may be what you think of as being um, like an outlier, um, but it may not be the only thing that's called an outlier. Um, um, so the second one would be like measurement error. So when you're measuring something, um, you're you're writing like you may have. Uh, uh, um, something like a depth sensor that, that you're building into a robot, it's returning some some measure of of, of, of distance to the wall, and this has a small <coughs> amount of error. So depth sensors on robots now actually are extremely accurate, um, but there are other error where, like the robot is it's trying to go forward, and you try and measure how far you've gone based on how many times a wheel has turned. And the wheels are slipping a little bit, and so you can get some error in, in this sense as well. And then this you need to kind of correlate with these various various other readings. So, or if you're taking a survey of people, they may not always, you know, put the right value. They may, when they ask how much income do you make, well, they may kind of guess. If, if they make, um, like, you know, they may say they make fifty thousand dollars a year when they really make forty nine thousand eight hundred. $62 a year, right? So, so they may just round up. Um, so you're going to get these sort of these sort of measurement errors in, in your data. Um, and then the third type is um, uh, on like background data. So th this could be something where you're trying to measure a specific population of users. 
So you're trying to measure um, uh, uh, um, so I'm trying to measure a set of patients who have, you know, um, uh, uh, um, like a certain disease, but I, I, I'm getting all the patients coming to the hospital. So I, I, have to, I have to, I have to, I'm trying to look at the effect that they have on the hospital, but I've got this background of all these other patients coming through. And so it's kind of, sometimes it's hard to filter out these, this, um, this background data in addition to the data you're trying to analyze. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish this um, from the interesting part of the data. Right, so if you have, um, so you could have a, um, so like a steady distribution of data coming from one distribution, and then there's some other interesting distribution which is all clustered in here, and you want to understand what's happening inside of this cluster, but there is also this black data set that came in here too. And you, once, if you just give them the data, you can't distinguish the black one from the blue one. I, I, if you can see the colors, yes, but you aren't given the colors, those are just kind of, uh, you know, you, you're just given the raw data set. So you can't distinguish this background data. And so this also turns out to be noise. And so when you're doing this, you know, you get points maybe close to here and they may look, maybe they're in, you know, maybe they're not in, and this kind of leads to some challenges. So uh, background data is also, you know, the, these are kind of categories I made up, right? But, but I, I like to think of this also as when you're, a lot of the data that you're getting online when you say people are filling out surveys, you're collecting information about customers, um, there's also a lot of missing data. So if, if you're dealing with um, you know, people rating different songs, for instance, well, you, know, you may have these 10,000 songs or like a million songs and no one has rated more than 1,000 of them or maybe the, a few thousand of them. So most of the ratings are empty. So this, this kind of, you know, do you store these as zeros in a matrix or do you put something else in there? This is kind of another issue of this background data. You need to kind of fill this in somehow and figure out how to deal with this. Um, so the other thing I want to mention about these spurious readings. Um, so in, you know, uh, up until uh, 10, 20 years ago when we started to be able to really collect a lot of data in a way that was very automated. We could be able to bring in this tons and tons of data. You know, people were collecting data very carefully by hand. It was often, you know, be scientists, you do the scientific method, you write down everything in your journal, your notebook, and if you have some sort of experiment that, that has uh, some really weird effect because you, like, like you did it, like you left a switch on you weren't supposed to leave on and it gave a really crazy effect, you'd probably look at that number and say, oh, this is clearly wrong, I'm gonna, I'm gonna filter, I'm gonna remove this, and you go and you look and you figure out um, the reason why you actually remove that. Um, so, but if, uh, if you're collecting stuff automatically, then this, this is much harder to do. You, you, get, you get this data coming in and you get this really crazy reading. Do you know, is that crazy? Is it, uh, um, like, is this not crazy? And so, sometimes you can see these things that are, you know, all your data is between zero and 10 and you have one thing that's like a million. Um, uh, because of some misfiring of the sensor, you can filter that out. But it's not always so obvious how to do that. Often you'll get these very, um, these high dimensional data set, uh, each data point has lots of attributes, and there it's not so easy just to plot the data and see it. There's, there's a growing area in, um, in visual analytics where people look at ways of visualizing data to try and see, um, and one advantage of this is it helps you find these outliers in really large data sets that you may not be able to see otherwise. But it can't always do that. You can't trust that you've always always found all the outliers. So we'll talk about you know, various ways of dealing with these sorts of error, this sort of noise in the data. Okay. And so, um, so there, there are various ways of kind of dealing with this, and the plan for today is kind of go through four different ways of, of, of dealing with noise. 
Um, the first one that we've, we've talked about in class, but I want to kind of go over a little bit more formally and talk about some, some variations on is, is cross-validation. Um, this, is, this is a very important technique if you're not familiar with it, so it's worth kind of reviewing a little bit more. Um, um, the next one is outliers. So I want to kind of spend some time talking about what are outliers, how do you filter out outliers, or maybe you don't want to filter them out, maybe you kind of want to deal with them in, in some other ways. And the challenges with doing this. Um, there's kind of a fairly general approach which shows up all over the place, and there are kind of fairly general problems with the, this approach. But that's basically the, the, the way to do it. Um, the third way is, um, so is to try and look at the uncertainty in, in individual, in, in, the, in the individual data points. So this is kind of, the, the whole notion of cross-validation assumes some model where all of your data comes from a single distribution that you, that you only get certain, certain kind of uh, views on. And we'll, we'll talk a bit more about this. And this uncertainty is kind of a dual view where each data point has its own noise distribution associated with it you need to try and model. Um, and so this kind of is kind of a different model of noise where cross-validation is a very fairly old technique. This one is kind of a much newer model that people have only been studying the last very, very kind of actively, probably in the last decade. And then the fourth technique is um, robust um, statistics. Um, and so we've talked about, um, 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 so we've talked about this a bit already. Um, so th this, this plan is, is actually fairly ambitious, and I probably won't get through all the material I have here. Um, so th this robust statistics, we've talked about these sorts of things already. This is kind of like using the median as a single point estimator instead of the mean, but this can be generalized to many other problems. And so if you look at the, um, the, um, the ridge regression, or the, or the lasso that we talked about on, on Monday, this is kind of a form of robust statistics. So there are more general, this often refers to something a bit more, a bit more specific. There's some notion of kind of this, uh, um, what's it called, this, uh, um, uh, on this breakdown point and so forth. So, but we've mentioned this a little bit in class, so I might not get to this, I may not get to the uncertainty point, but these are the two most important areas, so we'll focus time on these. Okay, so, um, and so again, this is not going to be as much of one of these, there's one kind of really cool technique with cool properties that we'll talk about in class, it'll be more of kind of a, um, a kind of potpourri of different views on this, um, kind of more, uh, um, some more kind of intuition of what, how to think about this, and some more, um, some more philosophical views and stuff. So, so please stop and ask questions, and you know, you, sh you should be doing it anyways. But this is kind of a, a good, uh, you know, a great, even better lecture to do that. Okay. So, um, so let's start with. Um, um, cross validation. Okay, so the, the 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 main motivation for this is that basically every algorithm, every technique that we've talked about that works well with noise needs some sort of parameter. Okay, so. Um, Um, so if you deal with noise, you generally need some sort of parameter. Okay, so, so if you're doing clustering, like k means clustering, then the value k is a parameter, right? If you're doing, if you're doing PCA, then the number of the singular vectors and singular values you keep, you know, that number is your parameter. Right, so if you're doing ridge regression or lasso, 
you have this this uh, this specific parameter in it, right? So that, so if you're doing um, um, so if you're doing bridge regression, um, where you're doing say y minus um, x times a, but then you also have this this alpha parameter times one times a, right? So you have this specific parameter, the larger this is, the more you're kind of filled, you're kind of hedging against that, the effect of the outliers. Okay? Um, so, it's, um, so if you're doing polynomial regression, you're trying to fit um, a more complex polynomial to the data, you're trying to say there are fewer outliers, the lower the polynomial, you're saying, you know, I'm trying to not try and fit the data because I assume there's there's some sort of noise. Okay, so so, so there's some sort of parameter here, and cross validation is a way for you to try and choose ch choose this parameter. Okay, and so up till now, I, I've kind of aside from mentioning cross validation a few times, I've the kind of the technique we've talked about in more detail is um, is this elbow technique where we we've said. The goal is to try and transform the choice of this parameter into some way where you kind of very simply see the effect and kind of plot, plot the effect with different parameters and choose something where it looks like you're getting diminishing returns. And for some ways, this, this, this kind of works well. If you're doing the SVD, you're going to get all these singular values and kind of look when they get pretty small. Um, but it's not really, um, this is kind of, this still feels kind of, uh, um, like ad hoc, right? So, so cross validation is a way to say, let's say something a bit more rigorous, a bit more you know computational. We can do to try and try and find this problem. And um, um, so the idea is you start with um, so you have an input data set P, and you're going to split this into t two data sets, and then the notes I call them Q and R, and this is so you can think of P as being here, and so you're going to split it into two parts, where this part is Q and this part is R, right? So it's a, it's a pure division of your of, of P, right? So P equals um, Q union R and Q intersection R is the axis. Okay, so I've 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 split the data set, and so we're going to call Q the on the training set and R the on the test set, um, and so then what you do is you um, um, you build your model M on on Q, and then you um, you measure um, the on um, the error. Of M Q M Q versus R using some parameter, let's call the parameter K. And then this error is measured based on your model, based on your train, your, your test set R and this parameter K, and you can, and what you want to do is given this this uh, um, and th this model will also be some function of K. Right, so, so this k is actually going to be as input of this model. Right, so, so maybe a better way of writing this is this is a model built on q and k, and it's measured on the data set r. And you want to find the value k which minimizes this error. Okay, so what you would do is you would build this model with every value of k. Or for some, you can maybe do gradient descent or something, so you don't choose every value, but you kind of do a binary search for the one that 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 minimizes the error with respect to the test set R. Okay, so um, so uh, um, so who has seen this before, right? So who's seen cross validation before? And so who's not seen cross validation? This is kind of a new idea. Okay, so this is this is a really really important idea, and it's important that Q and R are are disjoint sets, right? If you 
if you build if you build your model and then you test it with the same data, then you could be fitting model, you, you could be trying to you know, fit for this, um, but you may be fitting it on the noisy part of your data. Right? If there's no other, if there's one, da one data point or a small number of data points which is causing your model to have a certain effect, um, then if you test it, that's going to, you know, if you're testing it with those same data points, you're saying, yes, this was, that's why I built the model, because of these data points. But if you're testing with something else and those effects aren't there, they were actually noise, then you're, <laughs> um, you're going to be able to pull these out. Okay, so this, this seems kind of hard. I need to test this for all values of k. Well, if you remember with, with, this, with this least angle regression for the lasso technique, we actually automatically built it for all values of k. That was part of the algorithm constructed for all values. It wasn't k, it was a, a beta parameter. Um, but then we could measure this error on this stuff that we've left out. Okay, so, so maybe a more concrete example is, uh, so, um, so is this clear, or did, did you want me to go through a, a kind of a more specific example? Or, I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple concept, but it's, 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 it's really important to do this. So if, you, if, you're, if you're trying to come up with a new technique for doing something, you're trying to build a model, and if you just report the, the error on this, on this model, your, um, what you've done is you've, 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 you've minimized this error, but you haven't really seen kind of um, how well it's actually doing. Any, any paper that's coming up with a new algorithm, a new technique that doesn't use cross-validation will probably not get accepted into a conference or a journal, or to, at least not a good one. Um, so it's, it's, it, this is a very kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, accepted and you know, the way of, of verifying if, if you've done something. Um, so, so maybe I'll just write this up in a little bit more detail for dealing with the, um, for, um, doing something with ridge regression. Right? So, so let's say, so if you're dealing with this ridge regression, you start with the data set P, and you can think of it actually being this, remember it's this Px and this Py. Right? So there's this, this is the one parameter you're measuring on. And so we're going to split this up into, um, this up into the data set Q, which is Qx. Um, and so actually, let me call this xp, xp, yp, and so that I can break this up into xq, and y, q, and r, xr, and y, r. Okay, so, so then if I have a parameter alpha, um, um, so what I would do is I would solve for, um, I'm going to find this a q, which is, is going to be r min of a of y, um, y q minus x q a plus so actually this was A alpha. Okay. And then I'm going to, uh, uh, um, so then, remember this, what I really wanted to minimize was this least squares solution here. Squares are pretty clear, right? So I want to minimize this least square solution, so I don't care about this extra term here. I care about this least squares. So, so when I measure this, now I'm, I'm going to, um, have this this error value on alpha, which is which is going to be y r minus x r a q alpha. 
Okay, so I've, I'm now measuring with yr and xr, which is from my test data set, and, but I'm using the a I found with, with q and this value alpha. Right, so now this error is now a function of alpha here. And so then I can try this again with a different value alpha and try and find the, the value of alpha which minimizes this. And so if you remember, we said this, this will often, for some value alpha, will do better on unknown, on unknown data you, don't have, you haven't seen yet um, if you have some positive value of alpha. If you set alpha to zero, it's exactly ordinary these squares. If you set alpha greater, I said it should be better for some value alpha. But to find it, you need to kind of break it into the training set and the test set and test which value alpha works better. So, so the, the kind of theory behind this is that there's some um, distribution or some model mu, which is generating this data set P. Okay, so there's some underlying distribution that this describes the full set of data, which is not, you don't have access to this, you have access to this data P, which has come from some underlying distribution. And so you want to measure the error on essentially Y mu of X mu on this A. Okay, so, um, but you only have this view of P, so if you build a model on P, you may be overfitting to it. So you want to kind of generate more data from U to test it on. But you can't do that, so instead what you say is, well, let's just split up this randomly into Q and R. Um, and then build the model on Q and do this on R. And so the larger you set R, you know, you probably have a better idea of what the real error is, but then you have less data Q to, to, to spend on your model. Right? So sometimes the more data you have, the probably the better you, you're going to create this model, but then you're going to do a less accurate test. Okay, so there's this, there's this trade off how much should you put in Q, how much should you put in R. Um, in, a, in a lot of cases, when you're doing this, you may say, I'll put 10% in the, in the test data. Um, or maybe 30% in here. It depends on how, how big your data set is. Um, so there are actually instances on the, on the web where, um, so well, what a lot of these, these, uh, these large companies do is they want to test some, or they want to build a model for a new algorithm for, say, putting ads on, um, like on Google. So what they'll do is they'll siphon off 1% of all the incoming web pages and let our researchers or their, 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 their engineers run some experimental algorithm to build some model. And this 1% is Q. And then they'll evaluate it on the rest of their data. Um, and, and they'll see that, say, the rest of it is R. So then 1% then is Q and 99% is R. So if your data set is really big, you, then you can have a smaller fraction. So you want this to be big enough so you can build some, some good model. Um, Okay, so this is kind of the notion behind it. There's some underlying distribution, and you want to, the idea is, you want to measure the error on this distribution, not on the data that you've seen. So this idea of breaking this up randomly into P and Q is, is good, um, but, you know, you've, what if you, Split the data up in a strange way. It's a random. It's a random process. Maybe it it went wrong. So so what could you do instead of just doing one random split into P and Q? Cut what? Hash function. Uh, so a hash function. Um. Well. So so you. Is, is that, I mean, a hash function is a way of kind of, kind of uh, compressing the data or getting into an easier format. So I just want to split it. Maybe you could assign a random value in that to each data point and that puts it in one of the sets. Um, that's kind of not what I had in mind. So, so yep. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you could do P into Q1 R1. And so th this will get you a value alpha 1. And then you do it to again a, a different random split. Right? Um, right? And you get these different values of alpha, or maybe you want to kind of find the, the value alpha which minimizes these things on, on average. And so th th this is a more robust way of doing it. And so doing one split into tests and training data is, uh, is pretty good, but if, you're, if, if you have the resources to kind of do it more carefully, you may want to do multiple splits. So sometimes what you do is you do something like um, P, I'm going to split this into um, I'm going to split this into a decomposition into R1, R2, up to say RK. And so then I'm going to set that Q, um, so QI is equal to P set minus RI. Um, so, so basically you're going to have these different training sets, uh, I mean these different test sets, and for each test set everything else is the training set. Right, so maybe you have 10 different splits and you and you use this this uh, this test set the test data um, is all every every data point is in exactly one of these uh, uh, of these test sets um, and so the the the, um, the 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 final version of this is called um, leave um, leave one out cross validation and that's where each of the test sets is going to be a single point Right, so, so, so there what you do is, is actually P is equal to R1, R2, up to R um, the size of P. And so then you build, the, the, um, you build your, 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 uh, your model on each of, um, the, each of the, your full sets P except for, except for one point that you've left out. So this is leave one out cross validation, um, and, and so this is kind of a very good way that you still have p about the same size as before. Um, now you'd have to do this n different times, but then you're you're also using each each uh, test thing to be you know um, as as a single point once, and this this measurement can sometimes be a lot easier than than doing.